All right, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for the uh, somewhat vainly named Cricket Lou live event. Um, I'm really excited today that uh, we're gonna have a great show for you. I wanted to give you just a little bit of a story of why I think this is so important. When I was just getting started uh, in my career in IT, I was working for Hewlett Packard, which is not uh, based so awfully far from here in Palo Alto. And I was living up in San Francisco, commuting down with some friends of mine in a carpool. And one morning I got a call from the manager of one of my buddies, John, and he said, hey, Cricket, um, John's had a family <coughs> emergency and uh, he's not gonna be able to, to make it to work today. He was registered for a class in downtown San Francisco and it's too late to send somebody else, uh, or it's too late to get our money back, but we can send somebody else in his stead. So would you like to go? And I said, sure, if it means I don't have to drive all the way down to Palo Alto, that sounds great. And then sort of as an afterthought, I said, what's the class about? And, uh, and his manager said, it's about something called DNS. And I said, okay, don't know anything about that, but it sounds like an interesting enough topic. So I went to the class and uh, it was taught by Paul Makapetris himself, uh, the father of DNS, the man who wrote the original RFCs. And I have to tell you that there is no substitute for learning about a subject from the guy who invented it. And the treat you have in front of you today is that you'll get to learn all about response policy zones, or RPZ, from Paul Vixi, again, the man who developed the technology, the man who invented it. Uh, response policy zones are the first general mechanism for expressing and for transmitting DNS policy around a network. Um, also, I think this is a really timely event because Farsight Security, which is Paul's company, has recently inked a partnership with Infoblox. So now for all the Infoblox customers out there who use our Active Trust platform, you'll have Farsight's newly observed domains feed available to you, which I think is really exciting. So let's go ahead and get started. This is us, obviously. Paul over here on the left, with many accolades to his name, and uh, me over there on the right, as I said, kind of a piker by comparison. Um, we'll talk first about the need for RPZ and the need for what we call DNS firewalls, and then we'll look in some detail at how response policy zones work, the actual syntax that we use for configuring them, and we'll give you some examples of that. And then we'll look at something called an RPZ feed, the idea that you can use RPZ to effectively subscribe to up-to-the-minute threat data on your network. And then Paul will talk about how to get started with response policy zones. And then as a special treat, we have TJ Short, one of our customers, to talk to you about how he uses RPZs on his network. But first we need to describe why we need RPZs. So to do that, we need to trace the life cycle of the average piece of malware, how infection happens, and uh, how DNS is involved in this. In many cases, what happens with infection is that the bad guys create some sort of a phishing campaign. And the phishing campaign is generally centered around uh, some link, some domain name that they're trying to lure you to. They're trying to get you to click on this link. So typically, they'll register a brand new domain name, one that you've never seen before, one that has no negative reputation associated with it. Right? And it may, for example, incorporate a, a trademark or a trade name that looks familiar to you, but it is, in fact, not run by the folks you think it is. And they try to lure as many people as they can into clicking on that link, visiting the website, and having their devices infected. And when they become infected with some kind of malware, that malware, one of the first things it wants to do is reach out across the network to what's called a command and control server. Now, it doesn't just have a hardwired IP address for a command and control server. Instead, what it does is it either has, say, a compiled-in list of domain names that it hunts through looking for an active command and control server, or it has something called a domain generation algorithm, which synthesizes new domain names that it'll keep looking up and trying to connect to until it finds an active command and control server. And in some cases, the malware won't even be able to connect directly to the command and control server. Increasingly, on modern enterprise networks, you don't have a straight path out to the internet via, say, HTTP or TCP. So, in many cases, malware today will even use DNS 
for tunneling. It'll use it as a vector to reach out to the internet and surreptitiously transmit and receive data from the internet. So you can see that DNS is actually used throughout the life cycle of malware. In the initial infection phase, in communication or identification of the command and control servers and drop servers, and then later in the communication with the command and control servers and the drop servers. So you can see that we have this very, very real need for some sort of DNS firewall, some sort of intelligence to tell our name servers what they should and what they shouldn't do. Paul? Thank you, Cricket. So, oh, thank you. So, um, we've had firewalls since the mid to late 80s. They were sort of simultaneously developed in several different parts of what was then the academic and research internet. Um, and they all work kind of the same way. They are in the path of traffic, which means they have the ability to not forward something if they think it would be dangerous. Uh, so usually that is incoming traffic, but uh, as Cricket mentions, you can also firewall your outbound traffic if you don't want to offer a clear path uh, from your desktops all the way to the internet. You might want to force people to go through a proxy of some kind. Uh, firewall is what would let you enforce that policy. Uh, firewalls, though, were originally put in as IP layer devices. In other words, they would be in control of whether a given packet was or was not forwarded. And it would use attributes of that packet, like the source address, destination address, the protocol, the port numbers, that kind of thing, to try to categorize broadly uh, traffic as uh, probably safe or probably not. Uh, obviously, didn't know for sure, so I say probably. Um, and all of these firewalls uh, either were inspired by the, each other or just independently came up with the same mechanism as far as how you program them. Uh, the policy, the actual list of what should be allowed and what should be denied, tends to be a list of rules or several different lists of rules called rule sets. And in each one of those rule sets, you would have a bunch of rules, each having a trigger. In other words, if you see this and an action. In other words, then do that. Like if you see this source address trying to reach this uh, port number, then allow it or deny it. That would be an example of a firewall rule. Uh, not it. Let's try that one. So uh, we determined, uh, Vernon Schreiber and I was my co-inventor for this technology, uh, in the late 2000s, uh, about 2008, 2009 time frame, that this was a great idea, but it had uh, kind of fallen out of relevance. This idea of having firewalls uh, did not work because you didn't know in advance what uh, I, IP addresses were going to be good or which ones were going to be bad. Um, and we found out that it would be just a lot better if we could block things in the DNS server instead of waiting for the packets to be uh, sent corresponding to a DNS lookup. Um, I want to note, uh, when we first commercialized and privatized the Internet in the mid-90s, uh, domain names were still relatively hard to get. Um, and, you know, in that time, spam would often, uh, uh, Cricket mentioned a phishing attack, spam in those days would often have a dotted quad, a raw, literal IP address right there in the middle of the body of the email. Um, and uh, that was because domain names were too hard to get. Now they're very easy to get. And so the, uh, the original sort of catchphrase for this technology, DNS firewalls, is uh, let's take back the DNS. Uh, let's have it be that we don't offer the same excellent quality DNS services to bad guys as we do to good guys. So, um, again, it is a firewall, so it has to be in path. So I've uh, got on the screen right now a picture of the DNS data path. Pretty much, if you are speaking the DNS protocol, you are represented by one of those three clouds. You're either a stub resolver, which would be something like a smartphone or a virtual machine somewhere. You can be a recursive server. Probably you're running one of Infoblox's recursive DNS appliances that has some of our software. I was at ISC and I helped develop Bind, so we're very proud of our part of that appliance. Um, and if you ask that question, or excuse me, you ask that server a question that someone else has recently enough asked, it can fetch that answer from its cache, and you'll get a very, very fast answer. Uh, if you ask a question that it does not have in cache, it has to go further upstream to the authority servers. That's where traffic actually enters the DNS from the outside. So when we were trying to establish, okay, we need a DNS firewall, where do we put it? Uh, we decided to put it in that recursive server. 
uh, because it is the bottleneck through which everything must pass. You, know, you don't want to try and teach every stub how to uh, you know, decide what DNS is good policy and which, uh, which DNS represents bad policy. And of course, you don't know in the authority server who is going to be using this data or how. So really, the recursive server is where the, the DNS firewall had to be placed. So I mentioned uh, my partner in this crime, Vernon Shriver. He and I have worked together since before the internet was commercial. Uh, at first, uh, he was at Silicon Graphics, and I was at Digital Equipment. Both companies now gone, but uh, the friendship continues. Um, and uh, one of the things we decided to do was to kind of look at where are these servers, the DNS servers that we're going to turn into firewalls, where are they located? Not just where in the DNS hierarchy, but where inside of your average enterprise network or ISP network are these things? And it turns out they are often uh, behind a firewall because a recursive server should not be answering questions for the rest of the internet. An authority server has to. A recursive server really should not. Um, and so if it's behind a firewall and we wanted it to be able to speak policy, that meant we had to encode our policy in some kind of signaling protocol that it was already allowed to speak. I don't know if you've tried this, but if you go to your average enterprise security guy and say you want to make a change to DNS, he says that's a different team. If you go to your average DNS guy inside the same organization say, I want you to make a change to the firewall, he'll say, that's a different team. These teams don't always work together, they don't always sit together, and we didn't want to force them to talk to each other. So, all of these rules are encoded inside of DNS itself. And that's actually where the name comes from. We call it a response policy zone because it is a DNS zone that is encoded in a special and rather ugly way uh, to encode policy. Uh, it is a domain whose format only its mother could love. Um, so you won't like editing them or looking at them, but you will like with what they can do for you. Uh, that's the last point on the zone issue is that because it is a zone, it benefits from all of the technology changes that we have made in the last 25 years to zone handling. It used to be zones were fairly insecure. They would take a long time to propagate changes for you and to send the whole zone if it changed. All that's gone. We have the ability to send only the deltas, so tiny little diffs, uh, as often as once a second for our product. Um, and you can notify the recipient that there is new content, so they know when to fetch it. They don't have to wait some hours long period. And they're authentic, because we can use, sign them with transaction signatures. In other words, uh, even though we didn't pick them because the semantics were perfect, the semantics are perfect. Um, and uh, we, we would have picked it even if not for the firewall advantages. So, the same picture that you saw a few slides ago, now annotated to show where the RPZ logic is. Uh, you can see that somewhere there is some observation and analysis. And Cricket will have an example later about how you can uh, build a, a um, closed loop control system where you can actually react to the bad things by changing your DNS. So sometimes you're actually looking at DNS as part of that observation and analysis. Other times it's, uh, you know, maybe your SOC team is just determining that there is some bad thing out there. Uh, that goes into the response policy zone, which is then transmitted to the recursive server. And uh, that's really all it is. So I'm going to give you a tiny example, and then we'll go back to Cricket. Um, here's some spam I got. You guys have all gotten either this spam or spam that's a lot like it. Uh, nothing particularly special about it. That was uh, spam? <laughs> so I clicked on it, and it didn't work. I got a 404 error. And I thought, okay, that's good. I, uh, that means that some one of my friends who is uh, early adopter as an RPZ publisher has caught this domain, and uh, it is not going to be reachable by me because I am subscribed to an RPZ policy feed. Let's see which one that was. So... I did a dig. This is a DNS lookup command that comes with bind. Uh, it's, uh, it changes every version, but uh, this is the bind 9 version. And what you can see in red on the first line there is that the status is NX domain, uh, which is also Cricket's personal domain name is nxdomain.com. I wish I'd thought of that. Um, <laughs> but um, what, this NX domain is not a real thing. If you asked 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 .8, which is, oh, thank you, 
uh, Google's recursive name server, it would have given you, that day at least, a real answer for this because they are very proud of their clean feed. They don't have any policy around the 8.8.8.8. Uh, but I'm not using 8.8.8.8. I'm using my own server at home, and it's subscribed to a policy. And down there in the bottom in red, you see that it was rpz.serbl.org. Serbl is a right-hand side black hole list that was published by Jeff Chen. Uh, and is still going strong. It's a very fine service. It changes many times per day as they discover new things that ought to be blocked. So I got a negative answer that was a lie, and it was a lie that I essentially paid for by deliberately subscribing to that feed of lies where the lie is designed to protect me from going someplace that I probably wouldn't like to end up. Um, and that's as simple as it is. That's the, when you start to use this, that's all it becomes. Um, this is what my namedeek.conf file looked like. You see the serbal zone listed second. Uh, you generally want to always list your first, uh, as your first policy zone, something you can edit for yourself. And uh, Cricket and I will both talk more about that later. Uh, Spamhouse probably would have caught that same domain name, datafy.ru, but uh, these are processed in the order given. So the first answer that is dispositive is the one that actually ends the processing. Um, you can see it's a real zone, so uh, after mentioning it in a response policy clause in the options uh, directive, then you just have to uh, say how you get this zone. Maybe it's a master zone that you're editing on that server. Maybe, as in this case, it's a secondary or slave zone that you're fetching from somewhere else. If it's a sec secondary or slave zone, you have to declare who the masters are, which are the, these were the normal serval masters at that time. I have uh, three name servers. Uh, I guess I have a big house or just a lot of uh, complexity for no reason, but uh, I only fetch the zone once and then I notify my other servers that uh, whenever a change has occurred. So that's why I have to say also notify because Serbal only knows about one of my servers. Um, and here again, if you do a dig against the uh, policy zone itself, uh, referencing the local server, you can see what this looked like. It was a CNAME to dot. Now CNAME to dot is a pattern you will never see in a healthy, normal, non-policy related zone. It is ugly, and it is an example of the type of ugliness that we use to signal policy. And as uh, Cricket will shortly explain, C named dot has a specific meaning. It's what caused that NX domain to occur. Thank you. So there are five different triggers that you can use within one of these response policy zones to match some condition that actually occurs within DNS. So the first one is probably, I would say, the most common, wouldn't you say, Paul, which is the domain name owner of a resource record. Um, and what's interesting here is that this is not, strictly speaking, the domain name in a query. It may be, in fact, it may match the domain name that's being looked up. You may say, for example, I want to match any occurrences of www.foo.example. But you would also want to catch the case where somebody looked up www.bar.example and that turned out to be an alias for www.foo.example. So in fact, this matches any occurrence of that owner name when you're doing the recursive processing of, uh, of the query. So that's the most common one. Uh, another fairly common one is an IP address in a response. Uh, you, the, the information that you have about the provenance, about the disposition of a particular uh, a particular asset out there on the internet may be about an IP address. You may know that a particular IP address is being used maliciously, and so you want to make sure that that IP address is not returned to queriers, no matter what domain name they look up. If it maps to that IP address, don't return it. Right? And that could be IPv4 or IPv6. Obviously, that requires that the name server actually process the query. It has to actually go through the entire recursive resolution process to grab that answer and compare it against all of the IP addresses that it has in its RPCs. Client IP address uh, is another interesting option. Client IP address allows you to say, if the query comes in to the recursive DNS server from a particular IP address, I want to do the following. And we'll look at the various actions. Uh, unfortunately, today, go ahead. Let me just add, um, you don't have to list every single address. If what you have is a net block of uh, some certain size, like a slash 24 or a slash 19 or something like that, and you know that any response in that slash 19 ought to have policy uh, applied to it, you can specify the net block. It doesn't, you don't have to specify it address by address. That's right. That's right. Absolutely correct. So the client IP address, unfortunately, cannot be mixed with 
any of the other triggers, but it does allow you, for example, to say any query uh, that comes in from the following client should be answered with, for example, nothing. You can simply drop the response, or you could say answer all of the queries that come in from this IP address or this net block with a synthesized alias to something. The alias might be, for example, um, a portal, a web portal where somebody is, is sent that says, well, you, you need to do something before we're going to give you access to the broader internet. If somebody tells you you have to build a walled garden, that's what they mean. Yes, exactly right. Is there any hope of, of actually being able to combine uh, client IP address and, uh, and, and the other, uh, other triggers over time? That would, be, that would be pretty nifty to be able to say domain name plus this client IP address and have client-specific policy. Well, um, we could have made this a lot more complicated. Um, <laughs> and uh, I've had a number of people say, gee, it would have been better if you could combine this and say if only if this and that happened, then do the following. Um, and the difficulty with all of that is that once you create a programming language, you create software bugs. Uh, this is very simple. It is unambiguous. It's uh, relatively easy to implement in a way that will absolutely do what the operator thinks it's going to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's kind of pigeon language. It's not a real programming language, and that was deliberate. Yeah. Uh, performance is also incredibly important. Uh, you, this thing will slow your name server down by about five CPU points. Um, and if it had more uh, complexity, it would slow you down by a lot more. Yeah, absolutely. The last two that you see up here, uh, the last two triggers are NSD name and NSIP. Those both refer to the domain names and the IP addresses of name servers that you might encounter while doing your recursive processing. So if, for example, you list uh, a name server's domain name and NSD name, and you encounter that name server in, for example, a referral while you're re uh, recursively processing a query, then you will perform the corresponding action. Likewise with NSIP, if you see the IP address listed, in a referral from uh, another parent name server, then you'll take the corresponding action. So here are the various actions that are available to you. There's NX domain. That was the one that uh, Paul showed you earlier. That looks like a C name to dot in its raw form, but that says hand back an NX domain R code rather than whatever the actual answer is. NX domain means there is no such domain name, even though in this case that may well be a lie. No data means the domain name that you asked about does exist, but the type of data that you asked about doesn't exist for that domain name. So for example, there are no address records or A records. Maybe there are MX records or quad A records instead. Pass through means just process the query as you normally would. Right? Go ahead and process that. It's totally legitimate. Drop means do not respond. Right? Do not respond. Just act, act like a hole in the water, I guess. And then finally, TCP only, I'm sorry, not finally, but TCP only uh, synthesizes a deliberately truncated response from the recursive DNS server. So the DNS server sends back a UDP response and sets the truncation bit in the DNS message header to say, I couldn't fit the answer into this. Now, it's really lying. It might well have been able to fit the response into the message. But what that will do is it would force the querier to retry over TCP if it actually wanted the response. And the reason that you would do that is because you believe that it wasn't a legitimate query. You believe, for example, that the querier was using you as an amplifier and as a reflector in a DDoS attack, or maybe he was simply trying to DDoS you, overwhelming you with a lot of queries. So this is an interesting sort of anti-DDoS technique. And the other thing that's interesting about TCP only is that I hate it. Um, <laughs> And this uh, shows that even though this is not an IETF protocol with an open standards mechanism, that Vernon and I have tried to be very accommodating, and we want this to be a big tent. And so when somebody said they wanted this, I gave them my usual 10-page answer about why they really didn't. And uh, they said, uh, but really we do, and so we put it in. Now, the way you would use this in DDoS is, uh, let's imagine that somebody is... Um, spoofing the source address of some victim and sending queries to you, hoping that you will bombard that victim with uh, responses. Now, there are better ways to do this, but the way that this uh, can help you is if you use uh, the, the trigger that triggers on client IP address uh, and you use the action of TCP only, then what you're essentially saying is that if this victim is willing to try with TCP, which they would do if they sent a real query and got a truncation back, 
then we will answer it. Otherwise, we're going to send back a, a, a response that is smaller than the query. A truncation, in this case, does not contain as much information. And so it's uh, not a good DDoS amplifier or reflector. In fact, it's a DDoS attenuator. There are better DDoS attenuators than that one, but this is how that's intended to be used, is together with the uh, client IP trigger. Right. And local data, which is the last of the action, simply responds with whatever the specified data is. So this might be a way, for example, of returning the IP address of a web server or, or a honeypot or something that you want to direct clients to. I believe that the local data option was used quite successfully during the WannaCry episode. Yes. Because uh, you, you needed to be able to uh, control what answer they got to the command and control question. And faking it out to be negative would not have been a good, good idea. Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's a, a very good point. For those of you who followed WannaCry, which, which hit Telefonica and hit Britain's National Health Service, one of the things that WannaCry did was it did a DNS query for a particular domain name and if it got an IP address back and then was able to connect to a web server at that IP address, it used that as a kill switch. This was ransomware, and it would not actually ransom your files if it found an active web server out there. And we've got an example of that coming up so that you could effectively dummy that up. You could say, I want to answer the WannaCry domain name query with a particular IP address of some web server that's maybe within my organization, on my network somewhere, direct all of the queries there and then make sure that WannaCry didn't do any damage. I want to say that this was very cool that we had this tool available and it could be used in this way. Uh, but sadly, bad guys are adaptive, and they're probably never going to write another kill switch that is this easy to falsify. Yes, exactly, exactly. The second version of WannaCry used a different kill switch. I believe the one immediately after that had no kill switch at all. Yeah. So uh, here's another example of a namedy.conf snippet that would allow you to uh, deploy a particular response <clears throat> policy zone. This is one where we're using a local RPZ. So as Paul said earlier, one that we can edit ourselves. We can have direct control over this data. We don't just have to accept a feed from somebody else. Policy given here means we're going to accept the policy within the response policy zones. Now, it, this may have a different policy for every single trigger. Right. But if we wanted to, we could also override those policies here. We could say within this file, we just want to use one blanket policy across all of them. However, here we're using the policy as given in the zone data file. Log yes means that we should have our name server log uh, a one-line syslog message for every hit against RPZ. That's very useful. For example, if you've got a response policy zone that is chock full of command and control servers out there on the internet, a hit against that response policy zone is a very strong indicator of infection. It probably means that you've got some malware on your network somewhere. Right? And if you've got those log entries, you can go look at them. You can get the IP addresses of the potentially infected devices and go follow up. The log also gives you more detail. Right? I showed in my dig example earlier that you can get the SOA, the start of authority record, for whichever RPZ caused this lie to be told but you're not told which rule within that RPZ. That's right. Whereas the log does tell you that. And yep. So if you're wondering, OK, I'm blocking something I didn't mean to. I know it's in my local.rpz file, but where is it? You've got to look at the logs. Yep. So you've got to have the logs. Yep. Exactly right. Um, break DNSSEC, yes, uh, is an interesting modifier. Now, RPZ, by default, if I remember correctly, does not apply to answers within zones that are signed using DNSSEC, the DNS security extensions. The idea there, I guess, is that if somebody has taken the trouble to uh, sign their zone and to make the data in that zone validatable, you don't want to just modify it willy-nilly unless somebody accepts the risk of doing so. This is incredibly subtle, and uh, it's the kind of thing that IETF DNS engineers love to argue about at the bar. Um, so really, it's not quite as bad as you said, because uh, if it knows that it has a lie that it would like to tell, and it knows the zone is signed and it was able to validate the signatures, it will tell the lie if the client does not ask for DNSSEC services. Right. And so uh, it's really only the case where the client would be able to tell that you were lying that we don't lie. Right. And so this turns that last bit of logic off and says lie anyway. Yeah. Right. So the only real issue here would be if you had a downstream recursive DNS server using you as a forwarder and also configured to do DNSSEC validation. This would say to that server, I'm going to lie to you even so. 
That's true. Although I am hoping that we do someday have stub validation. I'd like to see Dane take off. I'd like to see the end of the X509 tyranny. So <laughs> there may be other applications for uh, uh, downlink DNSSEC someday. Yep. Yep. And then the last modifier you hear you see here is QName weight recurse, which is uh, I would I would say in with due respect to, to Vernon a little bit of a, a difficult phrase. Um, QName weight recurse no is effectively an optimization, and it says if you can identify just from the query, the domain name in the query and the type in the query, if you can identify a corresponding response policy zone rule, you can apply it before performing resolution. You don't have to go off and find the address. You can just apply it right away if you see that the domain name and type match. Well, so it's not just the name of this option that is terminally obscure. It is also the, uh, the details of why it's there. Um, if you're looking up content that was placed on the internet by somebody who hates you and wants to steal from you, that means they're probably running their own name server. And if you don't do a lookup, they will know that you're running RPZ. But if you do the lookup, in this case, uh, they won't know why you didn't then follow up with a real answer, but at least they won't see you behaving differently if you're running RPZ. So this was actually a technology and sensor illumination avoidance mechanism. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. And then, of course, here's the zone statement that has us load, load the, the particular local RPZ. And here is a list of examples of rules within a response policy zone in all of their glory, uh, as Paul said, a syntax that only a mother could love. The first one here uh, is for a dot example. And one thing I want to point out to you is note that it does not end in a trailing dot. All of these domain names are actually fully qualified domain names, but they're written relative to the domain name of the response policy zone. Otherwise, they wouldn't belong in the zone at all. Right? So this will apply to queries for a dot example, and you see that it's a C name to a freestanding dot. That's what returns an NX domain response for queries for a dot example. For b dot example, we have over here a C name to star dot. That means return no data. Right? There is no data of that type. Um, and then we have a couple of uh, a couple of owner names over here that refer to RPZ client IP. And what we have here uh, is the encoding of an IP address or a net block in a particular format. This is the first octet, second octet, third octet, fourth octet, and the number of bits that are significant. So this is in particular the IP address 192.168.0.1. And we see over here that it's a C name to the special domain name RPZ pass through. That means go ahead and process queries that come from that particular IP address. Whereas here, for everything else in 192.168.0.0/24, we're going to drop the responses. And then we have a couple of other things. Uh, this is a domain name game188.com that was used in what's called a random subdomain attack out on the internet. And what we're going to do there is we're going to force any queries that come in for that domain name uh, to be retransmitted over TCP. Right, so that's my attempt at showing uh, uh, a, a DDoS avoidance technique. And then finally, this last one is the kill switch domain name that was actually used by WannaCryptor or WannaCry. So it's this big, long, somewhat random looking uh, string. Um, we're pointing it to one of our own IP addresses. We're answering with local data, pointing it to a web server that's under our control so that when our infected clients are redirected there, we can see that they're infected and take some sort of action. So we could look either at the logs on the web server or, assuming that we're logging RPZ hits, we could simply look at those. Mm -hmm. So a um, couple of really minor points. Uh, oh. So I feel a, uh, I don't know, a moral imperative to explain why I hate this TCP-only option so much. Um, this is a recursive server. It should only be getting queries from your network. You should not have this problem on that server. Um, and so if you have this problem, it probably means that your recursive server is open to the whole internet, uh, which is your problem. And solving that problem using this technique is really a ships in the night situation. Um, I also want to explain the power of this pass-through. Uh, the pa pass-through option doesn't just say uh, no policy. It means no policy from any other rule set. That stops the lookup. So generally, when you have a uh, local RPZ zone that you're editing for yourself or in your uh, SOC, it is mostly full of pass-through rules to make sure that no other policy that you subscribe to has any impact uh, on those uh, responses. 
And um, so you can use this in a kind of a, a really odd way as a multiple if-then cloud. You can actually list several different local zones to make sure that you've exempted everything that you don't want to apply the policy to. So we don't have if statements, but we do have pass-through. Um, these two are, again, in the realm of obscurity. Um, this has to do not with uh, bad content, but bad players. So generally speaking, uh, going back to the uh, first set of, of triggers, if you know what name that you suspect is bad, then we have a rule for that. We have a trigger for that. If you know what answer you think is bad, maybe everything in a certain slash 19, we have a, a trigger for that too. Um, but if you don't know what name is going to be looked up, and you don't know what response is going to be given, um, but you do know what name server is going to be involved in it, if that's the only hook you have, then this is how you encode that. Uh, because this doesn't care what the question was or what the answer is, this just cares what name server is involved. And so uh, fairly often you'll see an NSIP rule for a slash 19 that you know is uh, some ISP in a country you've never visited that is, uh, seems to be pretty well dedicated to malicious activity. You just want to make sure you, uh, you'll never care what zone, what domain, what IP address, what CNAME. You'll never look at the content. Just the fact that that name server or a name server in that address block is involved is enough to say, I want policy. And that's why these two exist. Uh, they are the last two that we've added. Uh, they are the most complicated. They have had the most bugs. But right now, they are working, and people should be using them. Right. Uh, they, that was they, a public service announcement for Vernon, who feels very strongly about these two. They do impose a little bit more overhead than the regular sort of domain name anchored rules, right? That is true. Um, it's uh, another couple of table lookups. And so it will slow you down maybe an additional CPU percentage point. Um, but in this day and age, my smartphone has more power than all of DEC.com's Internet Gateway had 20 years ago. So I don't think we should be worrying about 1% of our CPU. So the word feed has been uh, kind of uh, oversubscribed. Uh, and it now means what any given security company thinks it means or wants it to mean. Uh, it's very muddy, kind of like APT. Uh, it doesn't mean anything because it means everything. Um, so this is not a feed. Uh, this, a feed would be, uh, I have a uh, stream of events that I want to send you, and you can process them. That would be a feed. Uh, this is much more of a subscription service. Nevertheless, everybody calls it an RPZ feed, so I have to bend to the new tradition, regardless of what I meant when I invented it. Um, so these feeds will be synchronized, right? The zone mechanism that we're using to carry them around means that you can have a single publisher, many subscribers, and they will all have the same policy. And I'll give you two examples. First, there would be you guys. You have a security operations center. You're going to have a local RPZ that you can edit. Uh, maybe you'll edit with a text editor. Maybe you'll come from a database, or you'll go through the DDI appliance and uh, put your content in that way. But um, what will then happen is all of the recursive servers in your network will subscribe to that. And every time you make a change, it'll notify all of those servers, and they will immediately fetch the differences, and they will immediately come back into synchronization. Uh, the other example is your, let's say, Farsight, your, or even Infoblox, your security provider. You have something like, I guess, what's now called IOCs, which is about as meaningless as feed, but nevertheless, it's an in, in, indication of compromise. And as you become aware of these, you as a security provider are going to encode them into RPZ format, and you're going to hit the go button. You're going to notify all of your customers. They're each going to fetch the deltas from you, possibly do another local spray down to their other servers. And again, your security policy as you publish it will very quickly be synchronized to by all of the subscribers. That's the way it's supposed to work. Uh, it works really well. Um, and... Um, yeah, I think that's probably enough, although I do want to say the Internet used to be a barn-building style community, uh, the sharing economy, as it's, as it's now called. And if you find that in your SOC you are doing research that would be of use to others, then you should consider the benefits and the liabilities of making your feed available to others, uh, possibly for free. Because if you block something... Uh, that's because you don't want it to be looked up by any of your customers or your end users or your family, in my case. Uh, but that's a little bit of leverage. If you want to cause the bad guy, whose bad content that is, to make less money, 
you might want to tell the world uh, that looking this up might be bad for them because you could actually cause a, uh, a movement. You could, you could move the needle by publishing your observations and conclusions in this format. Don't just use them yourself. Obviously, your corporate attorney is going to have uh, questions. <laughs> so uh, Cricket has already mentioned blocking CNCs. Um, uh, they acquired a company, Internet Identity, a couple of years ago that uh, had a really fine uh, DGA feed. Uh, they had that day's configure names plus the previous day and the following day in case there was uh, a clock skew. And just any other domain generation algorithm botnet that came up uh, was is added to that first. And so you can benefit from that centralized resource or research and uh, not have to do it yourself, not have to follow mailing lists and figure out, okay, it's the, what is the DGA and how do I encode that in Python so that I can generate my own names? You could just import this knowledge from people who are already in the business of finding it. Uh, phishing, drive-by is another example. Um, the way most mail uh, SMTP servers like Postfix are set up uh, is that they will not answer uh, mail. They won't accept mail if they can't look up the, the domain names. And so if you start to block uh, certain DNS patterns in your recursive server, that will cause you to also block email from places that want to refer to those. And so it's like a spam filter that you didn't have to pay for or even specifically configure. Um, and of course, there's a lot of interesting content that isn't in this format. I love the spam house drop list and the Cymru bogons list. They're in the same format. It's a weird text file. But um, I have a five-line Perl script that turns it into RPC. So when they change it, I immediately no longer produce answers for my local machines that correspond to networks that are on those lists. Um, DNS is the front of, it, it's your front door. And people have to knock on that first if they want to get in. Um, so anything you do here protects everything else that you are doing. Thanks. Well, one of the other things that I wanted to mention is that, that we've concentrated on security-related uses of RPZs, but it turns out that RPZs are, are actually kind of a Swiss Army knife for uh, system administrators, DNS administrators who have to deal with DNS resolution problems. One of the things that I've seen folks do is uh, when there is some sort of a resolution problem with uh, a site that they might need to access out there on the Internet, they might temporarily wire up a named IP address mapping, the correct named IP address mapping and RPZ and distribute, it, distribute that throughout their organization. So one thing, you called it a Swiss Army knife. And I want to say Perl is the Swiss Army chainsaw and RPZ is the Swiss Army lightsaber. All right. All right. Uh, one, of my, uh, one of my friends, Patrick Piper, actually had to, had to jimmy up uh, a very complex RPZ configuration for a large customer of his that had a, uh, an internal root architecture, one in which you can't normally resolve internet domain names from within the organization, but they were moving so many computational workloads to AWS that they all of a sudden developed a need to resolve Amazon AWS.com domain names, but they had to have the IP address translated into their own address space. And so through some crazy combination of RPZ rules, he was able to do that for them. I'm using RPZ instead of having a local host domain or a 127.001. Oh, so I've got that yeah. PTR and that A record and the associated quad A are all in my local RPZ now. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the other things that, that I wanted to talk about uh, is security threats that you cannot identify necessarily uh, via RPZ, something that, for example, might require some sort of external analytics. Um, for example, our, our products have anti-DNS tunneling features today. We can look at a stream of data uh, and we can say, this looks like tunneling to me based on my analysis of uh, the domain names in the query, the payloads being returned, doing uh, analysis of entropy and n-gram analysis and label length and R data length and all of this other stuff. This looks to me like somebody's using this domain name for tunneling. Well, that's great. We can stop that through the name server that actually does the identification, but by using RPZ, we can dynamically add the domain name being used as the tunnel to an internal RPZ and propagate that throughout an enterprise network and cut everyone off from the use of that tunnel, which is pretty exciting. Um, we have a similar sort of scheme that we use with our integration with FireEye. FireEye makes these appliances. One of the things they do is they take potential malware and they detonate it within a virtualization compartment. Uh, and decide whether or not it is in fact malware. Is it trying, is it trying to do something that's suspicious? 
Um, but one of the things they can do is they can say, well, it tried to look up this domain name, and it tried to access this IP address. And so if they decide that it is, in fact, malware, they can then communicate the domain names that it looked up, the IP addresses that it tried to access to an RPZ feed. And again, even though one FireEye appliance saw the malicious activity, you can protect your entire network from the results that that one appliance saw. So it's a very powerful method of closing the loop. Why don't we come back to that at the end of the, the presentation? But please do ask it again. So in the example that Cricket just gave, uh, you have significant power. Uh, just be aware that all power tools can kill. Not everybody needs that level of complexity. But if you do need that level of complexity, you're going to want RPZ to be part of it. So let's talk a little bit about deployment. This was written as originally a bind nine patch, uh, which is how Infoblox first became aware of it. Uh, it has since been implemented uh, officially in bind and unbound and cannot, which is from CZNIC and in PowerDNS. Those implementations are not all necessarily fully compliant with the latest spec, but they're all drifting in that direction. Um, the performance level is reasonable. It wasn't in the first patch. It was terrible in the first patch. And uh, uh, my friend Tom Burns down at ThreatStop immediately said, I know a way to fix that. And uh, uh, we, we fixed it differently over, over time. But the performance right now is fine. You, will not wor you won't have to worry about that. If you were running at 95% utilization and we took your last 5%, you had other problems. <laughs> um, when we add a feature, we make sure that it does not break older implementations. So you won't find that new content is meaningful to some old code base. Uh, we're, we're making sure that doesn't happen. Uh, and it's not an IETF standard yet. Um, I, I have a sort of a mixed history with IETF. I have worked uh, with at the various working groups, and I've sometimes worked apart from them. This struck me as something that was quite controversial and where we might easily spend two or three years just agreeing on the problem statement. And what I wanted was to solve the problem. So the current plan is to take the uh, latest version of the spec, which is in RFC format, and uh, give it to the IETF on condition that they publish it as is, as an RFC. So we have an RFC number on the current spec, after which we're going to surrender change control to the IETF so that any subsequent changes won't be coming from Vernon and I, they'll be coming through the normal IETF process. Mm. So uh, this is kind of the best midline of, of what we can do to get this out there. Uh, there are nine steps. If you wanted to do this, um, this is what you would do. Uh, you, you have to read the RFC. It's about, I don't know, eight pages, a little, little dense in places. Uh, you have to make sure your name server supports this. All Infoblox appliances that are under current support certainly do. All modern ones do, yep. Um, and uh, you should make yourself an RPZ uh, that you test with. Make sure you understand that if you add this, then it will cause some difference in, in test results. Um, make sure you can distribute that to various other recursives. Make sure that all the notifies and all that stuff are all working. You will find that your firewall may be more restricted than you thought it was. Um, and uh, again, make a change. Make sure it propagates efficiently. It should, it should propagate within seconds. You know, this is not a long wait. You don't get to go get coffee. If you have to go get coffee, something's broken. Um, watch your log files. Make sure that uh, it's only blocking what you think it should. Uh, you'll find that the log traffic from this is uh, very low volume. This is not like the, uh, the old bind thing where we would tell you about every broken zone we found. This is only telling you about hits. And there won't be very many of them because if, the, if it doesn't work, there won't be more like it. Um, so it's, it's a fairly, it's safe really to leave logging on uh, even in production. Um, and then go look for security producers who have content in this format that you might be able to benefit from. I'm going to give you a URL at the end uh, that will tell you where we, the maintainers uh, the, of RPZ, keep a list of all the people who have told us they have RPZ content. We can't speak to whether it's good or bad or whether they are good or bad, but we can at least make sure that if anybody tells us, we tell you. Um, and uh, you know, this, this should just become normal operating practice for you. It's terrible that we have to make the, inter the every edge of the internet this complicated, but that is the world that we're in. Uh, let's talk politics. So um, I spent 
uh, something like 20 business days on the ground inside the Washington, D.C. Beltway over an 18-month process during which we were fighting something that was called uh, variously SOPA, COICA, Protect IP. This was uh, the entertainment industry and the luxury goods industry working together with Congress to try to find a way to make the internet less helpful to crime, uh, in particular uh, copyright infringement and uh, brand infringement. And I'm in favor of stopping those things, but not if it means breaking the DNS. And so I spent a lot of time back there talking to uh, staffers, sometimes a member of Congress. Uh, ICANN uh, sent uh, their, uh, they had people that were also there arguing. And at some point, we released RPZ. And one of the staffers that I talked to said, but Dr. Vixie, you just invented RPZ, and yet you're sitting here in this office telling us that it won't work. <laughs> and I said, well, so here's the deal. If RPZ is seen by the end users who are affected by it as a feature, because it's protecting them from dangerous stuff that they themselves think is dangerous, they will not only thank you for it, they might pay extra for it. But if it is seen as something that is being put in place by some industry to protect that industry, uh, they're probably going to start using 8.8.8.8 .8 or even offshore their DNS or run their own DNS server. I showed them this picture. I said, if you put security in that people don't want, this is what's going to happen. And so RPZ cannot be used to have mandated filtering, which is what this law is talking about. It can only be used to have a value add filtering. And I make sure to tell this story everywhere because this war is still being fought around the world. I mentioned that there would be some uh, URLs at the end. That one at the end is the only one you have to write down. It refers to the others, dnsrpz.info. Um, and David Ulovich, if you're listening, thank you for registering that and having it for me when I wanted it two years after you <laughs> registered it. Um, and it's been cool. All right. Well, we'd like to invite TJ Short, one of our customers, up to talk a little bit about his personal experiences with, uh, with RPZ. TJ? How are we doing? Okay. Good, good. It's good to be Thank up here. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, that's right. So, uh, TJ, could you explain to us just briefly, uh, first of all, who you work for and, and what the company does? Sure. So, um, hello. I work for American Gaming Systems, and what we do is we work the uh, slot machines across, uh, not just for Vegas, but for uh, casinos uh, worldwide. So we do everything from protection of them from, from the security side to progressives to the money piece of it, uh, just the gaming as a whole on both table and slot machines. Okay. And what does your DNS infrastructure look like? Fairly complex, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the way the Internet works, I mean, you have to have DNS. And we use DNS, everything from t connecting to uh, Visa, to MasterCard, to the banking systems, to the gaming systems, to the casinos, uh, uh, what we call headquarters to, to various locations, branch offices, just all across. How many sites would you say you have? In total, as far as DNS connectivity, a little over 1,100. 1,100, wow, that's a, that's a tremendous number. Yeah, so, quite a bit. So um, I, I, I believe you've got personal experience with RPZ, right? You've actually rolled RPZ out? And uh, yes, both good and bad. Oh, okay, that's, well, tell us. <laughs> well, the bad part is, yeah, I hate to admit stuff like this, but like we actually, so before we got it, we really needed it. One of the things we had was we had a site office, a satellite office, that uh, we didn't have any protection at all. And somebody found a flash drive in the parking lot, decided to plug it in and see what it contained. I know that. Um, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They do that. And so anyway, they plugged it in, see what it did, and amazingly enough, it actually had a virus in it. Um, shocking, I know, but the guy, I mean, thought it had something cool in it evidently. But anyway, what it ended up doing was it ended up infecting and calling a CNC location in Russia. Uh, unfortunately, one of the places externally that we used to, to help us watch and monitor everything detected it, saw it, and shut us down. That entire office was down by email, by internet, by everything. They said, we're not going to open it back up until you clear everything up. Easier said than done. Um, when you don't have anything to help you with it, it takes roughly about a week to actually filter it all, clean it all up, and get it all up and running for them to open you back up. Doesn't sound like much, but when you have money and it's really critical, it really hurts. Once we put in um, InfoBlox into it, scan the location, everything came up just fine. InfoBlox is really quick at finding and detecting. What takes minutes for InfoBlox to be able to do took over a week for us to be able to fully clean out. So good and bad. Um, RPC is actually needed because it, it, it helps as far as detecting everything, closing it down, like I said, with using InfoBlox and RPC, 
seconds for it to actually fix the problem. Wow, fantastic, fantastic. Um, any future plans for, for RPZ? Anything that you'd, you'd like to do? Sure, actually. Actually, one thing I do want to mention about the RPZ um, and, and DNS security as a whole, one of the really cool things about it is firewalls don't really help when it comes to DNS and actually protection, RPCs and things like that. M most general companies have everything. You've got firewalls, you've got IDS IPS, you have email, you have spam, you have proxy protection. Um, sandboxing, you've got sims, you've got everything in the world that you can possibly use for security. Funny thing is, none of that actually detects DNS attacks. You're not alerted, you're not notified, you can have every one of those fully functioning, fully configured properly, and none of it will tell you about a DNS attack. So without using something like RPZ or things like that to actually detect that, it, 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 it's to you're totally vulnerable. No matter how much security stack is, it's just it's not possible, it just can't find it, it's not built for it. Firewalls can't handle it because they can't, they don't have the capability of the processing to be able to run them. There's too many distribution points. It's just not, it's not, it's not capable. So you have to have something to be able to use RPC to, to see the detection, know what's going on, shut it down, inform you of what's going on to where you can actually find something to where you, you say, okay, that's a bad site. And to your point, you, and then announce it to the world so that everybody else can understand it so they can shut it down too to, cre to help, to help fix other people that may be having the same problems. Um, future wise, uh, I kind of want to go with what Paul was saying, where, where you, 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 you help other feeds. You tell other people about things. The more, actually, that, I, that I, I actually find things across 1,100 locations, the more I can spread it, the more I can inform people of what's going on, the more I can actually make it better. So, absolutely. All right. Well, I don't want to monopolize all of your time. Uh, please stay up here. Let's go ahead and, and open the floor to questions, if that's okay. Um, if you are at one of our remote locations or if you are tuning into the webcast, please feel free to submit questions at support at performmedia.com. That's just one M-P-E-R-F-O-R-M-E-D-I-A.com. And uh, we'll get those up here. And I think we had a question up front, right? <laughs> the question was, how, how do you deal with uh, hosted you know, malware sites that are using a cloud service? They're not using their own DNS. They're just trying to track you from a phishing attempt? Well, I would imagine that somebody who's using, even if they're using cloud hosting, they're probably still using a unique domain name for whatever website they're, they're delivering the malware off of, right? And so you'd probably have that domain name in, in the, the RPC. That, that, that's my take. Paul, do you, you think uh, that's That would be my take also. We have a uh, product we call Domain Sentry that uh, helps identify those strings when they're used in anomalous ways. Uh, that could alert you to something that you might want to put into your local RPZ. Um, but ultimately, even if a mal malicious actor is in a cloud and they're not using dedicated name servers or dedicated IP addresses, they are almost certainly using a dedicated domain name because uh, facebook.com slash uh, criminal name uh, would get caught by the Facebook people. So they really want to uh, own the only part of the infrastructure that really matters to them is what the user thinks they're clicking on. And that's where you will find them. Okay. Um, we have some questions that have, that have come in uh, from our remotes. We have a question from Washington, D.C., and it's, can RPZ be used to quarantine infected clients? Absolutely. That's, uh, that's the client IP thing. If you know that uh, something has been beaconing in some way, it's trying to reach a command and control server, uh, that makes you suspect that it is full of software that its owner doesn't know about, uh, then you can add an RPZ rule to say, no matter what that, that thing asks, tell it that they need to go to this walled garden server that will tell them exactly how to call IT support and when the next training class is. That's right. That's right. It'll actually stop it before tunneling even occurs. Mm -hmm. um, and what's really cool is like, so there's lots of really cool software that you can use for DNS tunneling. Um, I mean, iodine, split brain, um, Ozyman DNS. There's lots of different applications that you can use to be able to tunnel and, and pull data out through the port 53. Um, when you're using that, though, as soon as it's downloaded and, and they, they control the, or they contact the CNC, RPC will actually detect it, know it's a known site, and shut it down. So the DNS tunneling actually cannot be created. So that's, yeah, that's yeah. a cool thing. Okay. Um, Ernesto wrote in and said, do I need a name server on premises? Uh, in, in order to implement a DNS firewall. Um, certainly it's easier to uh, deploy RPZ if you have administrative control over your own DNS server. 
So you could theoretically have a server that was not in the local office but was somewhere else in the world. As long as it has a bind view that says uh, queries coming from your network should be treated a certain way, then you can associate the RPZ rules with the view that is dedicated to that office. Uh, but that is really unusual. And right. you'd be much better off with a DNS appliance like the one Infoblox provides or even running your own version of Bind on a Raspberry Pi stuck to the wall with double stick tape. That Raspberry <laughs> Pi, again, has more transistors in it than I had in all of DEC.com in 1989. So you do not have to really worry about how much performance uh, it's going to have and whether it will be enough for this job. Right. And we actually have a recursive cloud-based service called Active Trust Cloud, which enables you to have, effectively, you can define your own RPZ feeds that are applied to your clients. And it requires a little bit of endpoint software on those clients so that we can identify you even though you're sitting at Starbucks or at your hotel or, or what have you. Um, we have a, a question from Chicago uh, from Eric. He says, on the subject of TCP only, we are an MSSP, so managed, managed systems, managed service provider, something like that. Security <laughs> service provider. Yeah. It serves DNS authoritative and recursive to our customers. Uh, we currently use ACE on Infoblox to limit recursive service to our customers' public blocks. While this takes care of a lot of issues, we occasionally have issues. What other things can be done besides TCP only? Hmm. It's not exactly clear what, what issues he's having. I mean, he's certainly done the right thing initially by restricting the clients that he offers service to to those that are, are on uh, net blocks that are authorized, right? And those are the first two steps. And uh, what I would fill in, the, the, the way I would gap those two is to say uh, his problems probably relate to a DDoS that spoofs the source address of some, one of his clients. And therefore, the source address is correct. It reaches the server. The server sends the answer. Um, so TCP only looks like an attractive solution to that. But uh, TCP brings a number of other dangers with it. And you probably don't want those. Um, so you should probably consider some form of rate limiting. And I don't really mean the response rate limiting that we put into BIND 9 in about 2010, because that's really meant for authority servers. Um, right. And it, it, right. it uses certain heuristics that aren't valid in the recursive case. But you may find that your router or your switch or even your host has a rate limiting capability where you could just say, you know, this given block of customer IP addresses really should only be able to generate a few hundred queries per second if it's more than that, there's probably a DDoS going on. So you might be able to, to get away with it in that way. Right. Um, but uh, you know, short of that, I think you will need a VPN so that that customer's traffic has to come to you over the VPN connection. And if any traffic comes from any other place, you know to drop it. Yeah. Our, our advanced appliances, to put in a, a brief plug for them, they actually do rate limiting as well. So you can say only 1,000 queries per second from the following net block if you want to. Um, this is a, a question. Somebody was, was uh, interested in elaboration of using RPZ for localhost and loopback. Okay. So um, it is so simple I don't know how to explain it. So <laughs> I, um, I've already explained that you should always make your own RPZ that you can edit and uh, list that first and make sure that all of your recursive servers uh, are subscribed to it. So if you make a change, then it synchronizes everywhere more or less instantaneously. And then you just use the local data mechanism. You just put data in that file that doesn't have any of the special weird RPZ markers on it. There's no RPZ pass through or anything else. It's just a resource record. Localhost tab A tab 127.0.0.1 hit return. Um, and because that data is completely unadorned with any of the ugly stuff that makes RPZ so hard to look at, it will be local data and it will just be used in answers in right. preference to whatever the truth would have been. Right. And the way that we used to handle that was to create typically a local host zone and a 0.0.127.in-adder.arpa zone. And the only functions of those zones were just to do those two mappings. One for the pointer record for, for 127 or... Uh, 127.0.0.1 back to localhost mm -hmm. and, and the reverse. So it's a, a more efficient way to do that if you've already got RPZ deployed. Exactly. Yeah. Um, somebody wanted to ask you, is RPZ just sync holing with more options? No, absolutely not. Um, you can use it to build a sync hole. Yep. Um, during the uh, DNS changer episode, we actually used this to control what answer you would get if you went to the website dnsok.us. Um, and... Uh, 
and, and so yes, a sinkhole that has RPZ as part of it is really possible. But no, the, the, this has a much broader purpose of giving bad guys bad service. Because mm -hmm. the default, as you know, uh, even without InfoBlocks helping, the DNS is pretty reliable. It works really well. Yep. We don't want it to work really well for people who are trying to steal from us. <coughs> And uh, here's a question that uh, came in from our, our friends at Taco Bell. They said, that's, that's not a location. They're, they work for Taco Bell. They're not, <laughs> they're not dialing in from Taco Bell. Uh, they said, how does RPZ compare to uh, DNS and web filtering support that vendors like Palo Alto and Fortinet provide in their products? Um, I am not familiar with the, all the details of those products, but uh, I know that they are not... DNS servers, right? So to the extent that uh, any of these uh, in-path solutions are able to modify the responses that you're seeing, they would have to act kind of the way the uh, Great Firewall of China acts, which is they're looking at traffic, they're guessing this is DNS, they're guessing that by the port number, and then they're inserting their own answer. Um, and for all I know, that might work really well, but uh, I would prefer to have this logic in a DNS server where I can debug it. One other thing that I'd say about, about the difference between, say, uh, Palo Alto's features and, and, and RPZ in general is that the DNS server is much better able to do triangulation. <clears throat> so, for example, if you imagine an advanced firewall, a next-gen firewall, whatever you want to call it, that can actually look at DNS queries and say, oh, somebody's sending a query for something that I believe is malicious. Well, it can flag that, and it can say, I got the query from this IP address, but the IP address that it thinks it got the query from is probably your internet forwarder or some random recursive name server within your enterprise. It is not the client that's infected. And it's only the local recursive name servers that actually know the IP address of that infected client. Yeah, that's an example of what I mean by debugging. Yeah. I, I want to be able to get, get in there and figure out exactly what's going on. Um, but maybe if I were operating a really large network, I would say that wasn't practical and I needed this other solution. So I don't want to uh, dismiss it. I just want to say I have no experience. One thing you might want to be careful about, too, is getting the all-in-one products because through the demo model, they each work and each one of the independent things within that product work. However, when the heat comes on, when you're hit by DDoS attacks, when you're hit by different types of, of, of overwhelming uh, data coming in, they tend to fail. The procs die. Um, it, it gets to the point where they can't do all the individual things. Now, if you get small traffic, it, each one of them works just fine. But it's just be kind of leery on, on having one of those all-in-one things and being able to handle them. Now, Fortinet, I will say, is a little bit different because they have ASIC cards inside that are built for each one for independent items in, independently, so it's a little bit different. But just the all-in-one products as a whole, you might want to be careful about that, especially when it comes to DNS and DNS attacks and being able to use RPC. Having a, an indi individual device to be able to do it with the compute and the distribution points is really important to have. Okay. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank you all very, very much for tuning in today. I hope you enjoyed this as much as, uh, as, much as I did, as much as we did, and I hope you'll tune into our next event. Thanks.